Marcus, welcome to the podcast. I'm happy to be here, my man. I wanted to start the conversation by giving our listeners kind of a, a bit of your backstory. So you were born in Beirut, but I guess just if you could speak to your 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 backstory, your upbringing, what, what even brought you to the United States? You know, I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. So uh, I, I was born in Beirut, Lebanon. In fact, I recently went back there about, uh, gosh, about two years ago now. Lived in an orphanage until I was nine months old. Adopted by an American, Lebanese, and Greek family in Miami, Florida. Uh, grew up in Miami, Florida the whole time. Worked in a family business. My family was in the car business for years. And uh, growing up was kind of interesting for me. I always struggled um, to find my way. I'm an only child. Um, and being an adopted only child isn't exactly as easy as people would think, but I'm still blessed. Uh, struggled with my own skin. And it'll I'll explain it a little bit more later of how business solved a lot of problems for me. I uh, went to high school in Miami and decided to leave Miami because the weather was too good and the women were too pretty. And I moved to Milwaukee, Wisconsin uh, and went to school there because I just wanted to have worse weather. Uh, went to Marquette University. Uh, when I finished at Marquette, I went back to Miami. I ran for office and uh, the journey really started for me in business while I was running for office, where I was at a fundraiser on Miami Beach and Wayne Heisinger. And Bob Graham, Senator Bob Graham at the time, came up to me both at the same time. They were friends and said to me, you know, you have no shot at winning, right? Like there's like a zero chance. And I said, well, no, I didn't know that. But if that's the case, why would you come? And they said, well, because, you know, the odds are always uh, uh, they're not ever 100 percent. We wanted to meet you and we want to talk to you after you lose. So after I lost, uh, I ended up building a relationship with uh, Wayne Heisinga in a company called AutoNation. And I spent a considerable amount of time. And you fast forward uh, to today, where my primary business is similar to the auto business, but I uh, sell one out of every four RVs in America. If there was ever something to be excited about during COVID, which God forbid there's, there's not, a lot of people lost their lives and people were sick and people lost their businesses. Being in the RV business was the silver lining as America decided that it wanted to see something different. And uh, my journey is uh, not as complicated as people think, but it uh, it probably requires four hours instead of one. Were you entrepreneurial from an early age? I was always entrepreneurial, but my reason and my motivation for being entrepreneurial was different than one would think. Uh, in most cases, people are attracted to money and they're attracted to wealth and power and and while I definitely like the power that comes with wealth, because I have the power to influence change, I, my motivation was really trying to give me something to belong to, some, some purpose in life. And I was always awkward. I was the small, long-haired, fat kid in the neighborhood that was always the last person to be involved in everything. And so I found that I was really good with numbers, and I was really good with my mouth. And uh, my mother said, if you talked as much uh, in business um, uh, as you do outside of business, you're going to be very successful in business. So I started selling candy. I started cutting grass. And I started doing a lot of things that a lot of small entrepreneurs do as kids. And most people hear that and they roll their eyes. When I tell you I was in the candy business, I was in it. I used to probably make two, $3,000 a month as a nine-year-old. And then I got into the lawn business and I was probably making $5,000 a month. And it wasn't the money that excited me. It was the empowerment of being able to change things that took my loneliness as a kid. And it gave me um, sort of a different stature in my neighborhood. All of a sudden, I became the guy with cash and the guy that could hire you and the guy that could fire you. And as a nine-year-old, when you don't understand the importance of people because you're just a punk kid with some cash in his pocket, you start to make bad decisions. And I think entrepreneurship, um, which is a loose way of saying I don't really have a real job, I just make one up on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, gave me the ability to find my own footing. It gave me the ability to understand what I was good at and what I wasn't good at. But more importantly, it gave me an identity, something that I was really missing. And from, from what I've read, it, it, your exposure into the auto industry, there's always like two names that come up or two, two gentlemen in particular that it, it seem to have either served as mentors or created opportunity mm -hmm. for you if, you, if you could speak to that. 
You know, I would say that, that, that you know, Wayne Huizinga was clearly an influence uh, of mine, but Lee Iacocca also was. And people always ask me all the time about Lee Iacocca stories. And, you know, now that he's passed, I keep my stories far more G-rated than when he was alive because I felt like I had a license to talk more freely. But I'll say this to you. Um, anytime I get asked the mentor question, people assume that a mentor is somebody that is an elder statesman with uh, financial and business success that's going to teach you how to be like them. And I, I would say that it was quite the opposite for me. My mentors along the way were people that worked in my family's business or people that worked uh, in different businesses that I had that were on the front line that gave me a different sense of reality than you would see in an ivory tower. Really understanding how the worker is affected by the employer and how the worker is affected by the customer and how the ultimate worker, the people that actually make the bread and butter, not the people that buy the bread and butter, the people that make it. I learned early on that in order for me to be successful in business, I would have to have my ear closer to the ground at the front line and less to the ground at the executive office level. And in many cases, that got me in trouble. As I was starting my career and I was trying to move up in companies, I always slanted to be the employee's manager, not the owner's manager. And it was a problem for me early on because I, I didn't play the game of politics. I rallied my troops and I let performance of the business or performance of myself sort of do the talking. But I realized that it was the performance of the people that I worked with, not my own performance, that opened up the doors for me. And ever since that moment in time, particularly in investing in these small businesses, I realized that if I don't have the attention of the frontline folks and have the attention of the customer, that it really doesn't matter long term. And you hear this a lot. You know, you say this a lot on, on The Profit. You always talk about the three most important aspects of any business. Um, I, I love for you to elaborate on it, but also just speak of what, how did that originate? Was, just that, was that just through your experience? You could distill it down to really three key things? I always philosophically knew that the people mattered and the process of how you run your business mattered and the product mattered. But I'll, I'll take an extra minute and sort of break it down for people. When I talk about people, process, and product, it's really quite simple. And I wanted to dumb it down for educational purposes so that people can hear it and see it and swallow it in a way that's digestible. But the, 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 the layman's version of it is you can't be in a business and sell a product or a service that people don't need or can't relate to. And the silliest example would be if I told you that I was going to open up a company and sell a track cassettes. I'm going to have an amazing supply chain process. My people are spectacular. We have a great, uh, a great system inside of our business. Process is refined. Our marketing is great. But the reality of it is, is that people don't want eight tracks. So the product has to be relevant. It has to be market competitive. And it has to be something that people actually want today and tomorrow. On the process side, it really is simple as how do you take a relevant product or service? And I can use legal services as an example. How do you take that service and deliver it to the consumer in a way that they're not intimidated by it, the way that they understand it, and the way that they'll accept it, adopt it, embrace it, and engage. And ultimately, you know, we all think about the practice of law or the practice of medicine. And as consumers, we want to know that we're going to be able to understand it financially and understand what we want out of it and how it's going to be delivered to us. Okay, so we've gotten through the process and the product, and that's sort of the easy part. The hard part for me was always trying to explain to people how people, the, the people that actually run the business, the people that actually transact with the company, the vendors that support the business, or the guy or the gal that owns it, ultimately determine if the product or the process get executed or not. And if I liken it to something very simple like a lemonade stand, we all know what a lemonade stand looks like, and we all know what lemonade tastes like. But if we don't engage with the person selling the lemonade, and we don't buy off on why we're buying it from them, and we don't have a relationship with them, and they don't engage with us in a way that's understandable and non-intimidating, we won't buy their lemonade. 
And so it's funny because this is the first time that I've actually thought about applying my three Ps to the legal field. And some people would say, look, a lawyer um, has a bad rap, which I think they do. They're delivering a protective service to the community. I want to be clear with what I mean by that. A protective service, not a housekeeping service or a car mechanic service or a doctor service, but a protective service that's ultimately going to advance my business or advance my family, one of the two. And I need to understand how to deliver that in a way. And I always wanted to be a lawyer. In fact, in the summer between uh, my high school years, I worked at a law firm in downtown Miami. I worked in the mailroom. And I remember people saying to me, you know, you're wasting your time working in the mailroom. And I learned early on that I was understanding how the, the, the entity uh, operated. And I understood how the personalities interacted. And I got a chance to see all these different people. And as years went on, I started doing more. For me, the best job I ever had, no BS, was working in the law firm to understand how this firm represented families and businesses that were in crisis, that were in growth mode, that were in dispute, that needed to protect an idea that they had, and that ultimately gave me the gateway to how to framework things as I move forward in business. Most people are intimidated by lawyers. Sometimes I am too, I guess, you know, especially when they chase me and they, they want to, you know, pursue things from me. But in most cases, I see them as assets and resources. And, uh, and that's why the people side of things matter because if you, if you have a relationship with somebody that's more than transactional, it ultimately works. Hey, Marcus, I, I want to almost go back in the story, if we may, or I guess this is even present day, because today you're, you're the CEO of Camping World, multi-billion dollar publicly traded company that with you at the helm has not only grown exponentially, but it continues to become more and more profitable. So yeah. I, I saw the recent earnings announcement, and I think it's, it's fantastic. If you look back on that, are there certain key decisions that you've made that you can attribute this, let's say, sustainable growth and profitability to? I think the recognition of my mistakes were probably the most important thing to push the business forward. And I think a lot of leaders are often hesitant to take the full brunt of a mistake on squarely on your forehead or squarely on your chest. And we so often blame it on market conditions or we blame it on COVID or we blame it on the economy or we blame it on our people or we blame it on our competitors. And the reality of it is, is that if I look at my 20 years in building the business from a a zero business to a $7 billion business, from a business that made no money to a business that, you know, will make north of 600 million this year. I really had to have a strong dose of humility and reality to the good decisions I made, but more importantly, to the mistakes that I made that, that cost the business money, that put it in peril, that uh, uh, caused it harm. It's a hard thing to do and it's a hard thing to stomach. And I would say in the early part of my career, I struggled to do that. I struggled to, to look myself in the mirror and admit like, man, I really whiffed that one. Like that was bad. And the business is gonna lose $100 million. The unfortunate part of doing that, and maybe the most important takeaway in this lesson, is that the acknowledgement of the mistake isn't something that you could ever erase. It isn't something that anybody's going to ever forget. And it will always be something that people will throw back in your face. It shouldn't change the way you move forward. It's something that requires you to build thick skin. It's something that should cause you to have more temperance when you're going to make the next decision. But when you're an entrepreneur and you're a risk taker and you're a leader, what it usually does is nothing. The acknowledgement ends up being more for your humility and more for your people to see that you don't have all the answers. But I would say that the acknowledgement of my several mistakes is what's allowed the business to blossom long term. So from the early childhood business of, of selling candy to now leading thousands of employees across you know, multiple cities, I, you know, I have to ask, I mean, what's that experience like? I mean, is there anything that can prepare you for that? And you know, on the other side of this, you work with a lot of small businesses and smaller teams. How, what are the biggest differences between what you experience at Camping World versus the businesses you help? 
you know, the 12,000 or 13,000 employees that we have at Camping World and the size of the business is nothing more than extra zeros. The principles behind running a small coffee shop and running a $7 billion business are ultimately the same. Yes, the product you're selling is different. And yes, there's a bigger system and a bigger infrastructure. But the theories, I think, are they're relatively the same. And when I look at the lessons from running a candy business to running a $7 billion business, I'm not sure that they're really different. The, the problems are more complex and the, and, the, and, the, um, and the resources are more bountiful. And so the, the downside of running a small business is that you're really lacking a lot of resources in your mind. And you walk into a scenario where you believe that you can't compete with somebody bigger than you because your bank account is smaller, because your internet site is smaller, because your buying power is smaller, because your marketing prowess is lower, because your talent pool is different. And I think all the things that I just mentioned, mentioned quite frankly, end up just being nothing more than excuses. But what's helped me uh, help smaller size businesses is to take all these learnings and all these mistakes and all these challenges that I've had in my own life and remind them that really two plus two is four, no matter what the size of the business is. Interacting with an employee is the same regardless of the size of the business. Responding to a lead with a customer and doing it in a professional manner, in a timely manner, has nothing to do with the size of the business. And this idea that small or big should dictate the way you run your business, I think, is a bit flawed. And I know you've been very, very public around a lot of the, the future of, of Camping World. It, it's not the Apple model where you kind of, you know, uh, work on it in a room and then unveil when it's ready. And you've been hinting at it. Like if people follow you on Twitter, they can see like Electric World, the things you've planned. Um, what, what is the reason why you're just very open about it, even while that R&D is happening? There's only one reason that I tease the market with stuff, and that's because my employees who are working on it every single day are fueled by the excitement. And they like building things that can be put on a bigger stage than they ever imagined. And I love the fact that I could take somebody else's work and give them the stage that they deserve. I also like um, uh, uh, having a bit of an unorthodox business approach and interacting with the consumer. I think too often big public companies are so scared of the SEC and so scared of being sued and so scared of shareholder lawsuits that they struggle to to engage with them and they become very transactional with their customer base uh not realizing who their customer base is and yes i do have to be thoughtful about what i say and do to not get in trouble but i will get right up against the chalk line because i feel like when customers feel like you're giving them something that they're not supposed to know and employees feel like you're promoting something that they're working on that people aren't supposed to know, you create this magic. An electric world or going to Canada or making acquisitions or launching new technology platforms or, or doing something different is fun. Business is supposed to be fun. And in a world where over the last 12 months we've watched hundreds of thousands of people die and people lose their job and businesses close, I really worked hard to try to be some sort of shining light to give people some belief. I know it sounds corny that the sun will come out tomorrow. And I spend a lot of time trying to do that. And whether that's promoting women-owned businesses or minority-owned businesses or my own businesses, I feel like um, in the darkest of nights, uh, I know that my mom, who's no longer with me, would want me to be the brightest light as opposed to the darkest candle. And and with everything that you've you've grown with Camping World, I heard you at one point refer it as your ATM machine. I, I'd love to know what the what you know what was the impetus behind the profit, right? So for people listening to this that may not be familiar with the show, Marcus essentially helps you know, turn around struggling businesses and you invest your own money in doing so, which I think is a is a big differentiator. It's a, it's a phenomenal show. How did it come to be? Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna start from where we are today, and I'm gonna work backwards. The show, uh, eight years later, has become both an asset and a liability for me. 
it's become an asset in the sense that I had the, the, the one of the world's greatest platforms to teach young people, particularly high school kids, grade school kids, college kids, about the nuances of business. It's been a great platform for me to teach small business owners or aspiring business owners some techniques and some ways to think about things. That for me has been the most fulfilling part of it. I think early on when I started the process, I thought it was going to be the, the world's greatest deal flow. And that it was going to be, I was going to be starting this, this, this on television venture capital firm that would be on display for everybody to see. And it was going to focus on these nuanced small businesses. And from that was going to create additional deal flow. That's the logical place. When I started the process, and I think this particular audience will appreciate this more than others, I operate on a handshake. And I did that from day one. And as I went through that process, uh, everybody around me kept saying to me, this is dangerous. This is bad. You're not papering things. You're writing checks. You're going to get burned here. People are going to manufacture things. And my response was, listen, I can't control people's behavior. At the end of the day, and I admitted this finally publicly about eight months ago, that the whole process was nothing more than a giant social experiment for me. And that I knew that there was risk that I would lose some, if not all, of the money that I invested. When you invest in certain people who don't value themselves or don't invest in their own process, and you're investing in a space that's already heavy with risk, you know what you're signing up for. I knew what I was signing up for. More recently, when I say it's a liability, I now find that eight, seven, six, five years later, people like to come back and say, I didn't get what I signed up for. I didn't get, uh, I didn't become a millionaire. I didn't get this. I didn't get that. And what I learned through the process is that my social experiment was right. When you hand people an opportunity, whether it's in currency or it's in ideas or it's in time, how they respond to that will ultimately determine if they're going to be successful in life or not. How they respond to the opportunity, not how they respond to how you make the cookies or how you deliver something. It, it started to become much simpler than people process and product. And the people process and product started to become the technical instruments that I would use to teach people that were watching the show. Okay, those are like the, the technical takeaways. How the participants reacted to the opportunity one year ago, eight years ago, really ultimately determined not only the depth of their character, but who they were as people. And it's kind of ironic. I've done over 100 businesses, like over 100 episodes now. And there are about two dozen people who feel like they didn't get what they signed up for. I didn't expect to look bad. I thought I was going to get $10 million. I didn't, he didn't fix what he said he was going to fix. This didn't happen. That didn't happen. And then there are a whole host of other people who say, I'm grateful for what I was exposed to because I learned about myself and I fixed my own family and I fixed my own business. And while my business maybe didn't make it, I got better. Those are the game-changing moments for me where I had my own learning curve. People ask me, like, what do you think people learn from the profit? And I'll say, I don't know what others learn. I know what I learned. And while I go into these different businesses that range from flower shops to car dealerships to honey stores to anything you could think of in between, I think that, that the, everybody has to remember that the greatest recipient of education through the entire process was me. And I paid $75 million to get the education. Now, People would say to me, holy Moses, $75 million. And my response is, yeah, $75 million. By the way, in that same eight-year time span, my core business, my, my most favorite child, the most important thing in my life other than my wife, is my camping world business. 
And I feel like that business is a $7 billion business today, will make north of $600 million because of some of the learnings that I had through that process. People say to me like, okay, wait a minute. You're trying to tell me that your, your good and bad experiences in investing in small businesses helped you build the $7 billion business. My response is, yeah, it did. Because I learned about myself. I learned more about people. I learned how people behave. I learned how to get people to do certain things in a different way. And so who's the joke really on? Me? Probably. But in the end, I feel okay about it. And I know you mentioned early on that, you know, business solved a lot of problems for you in, in this experience, uh, uh, let's say across these hundred businesses, um, at times I'd watch this, an episode and I, it almost felt that you cared more about the success of that organization sometimes than, than the, the founder of that organization. And I wonder if your upbringing, did you find yourself wanting to help people? Was that an ego thing? Was it an empathy thing? Or just because of, you know, you wanted them to be so successful and you saw that there was a path to that. Did that ever create any blind spots? Probably a little bit of all the things you mentioned, right? Uh, I would be I would be lying to you if I told you that my 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 ego of thinking that I could fix anything wasn't a negative fuel in my early years, right? This idea that I could solve any problem, give it to me. I'm the Rubik's cube guy. Throw me the Rubik's cube, I can fix it. I think as I grew older in the last three, four, five years, I started to recognize uh, the deficiencies in my own logic and the deficiencies in my own judgment, uh, both of people and of process. And I think that if you watch an episode from eight years ago and you watch an episode today, I see a maturation in myself, a learning curve in myself. And I hope that other people can see that I still make mistakes today. I made many before. I'm learning like you're learning. And I started to really ask people to stop thinking that I was the business fixer. And I was really more of a people whisperer. And that I really could get people to do things differently. And and I've had people come after me and say, yeah, you say you're that person, but you didn't fix that person or that person or that person. And their business didn't make it, so you must not be that good. And my response to them is, well, I never told you that I was going to fix everything. And I never told you that I had all the answers. But I did tell you that I would put myself out there, spend the time, spend my money, and put my reputation on the line. And if my reputation gets tarnished because something doesn't go right, then it doesn't cost you anything. It costs me something. And I think as I sit here today coming out of COVID and thinking about all that we've learned, I recognize the error of my ways. But I'm still more proud of the good things that happened than I am the things that didn't work out. Well, and, and I can say that for the, through the multiple seasons, there's so many people, I mean, I've, I've gotten such value out of it. I know so many of the people listening have gotten value out of it, um, that you continue to, you know, to, to support those businesses, put out that content. I am curious, just looking back over the last eight years, What's been the best deal you've done on, on the profit? Well, most people would expect me to answer that in an economic answer. And I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to do that. Um, but I would say that, that the relationships that I have forged with about 40 businesses and 40 business owners and the employees that have come from those businesses have probably been the best group of mentors that I've had. And I know that seems weird. Like, how could you be getting mentored by people that own a barbecue restaurant in South Carolina? Well, I do. When I'm having a tough day and there's something publicly that's out there that I don't like or they don't like, I'll get a phone call from them saying, okay, all right, that didn't work out. No big deal. You got this. You're fine. We're here for you. If you want to come down and hang out with us and hide out, we're good. You don't just find those relationships on the side of the street. And, uh, and I'm grateful for them. And so I would say all of those deals where my relationship turned into more than just transactional would be the best. Sure, there are a few where I've made really good money. Um, I can tell you there's a long list of them that have been the opposite. And I can think of probably 
20 plus deals where I've lost 35 to $40 million. Gone. Never see it again. And uh, in, in many cases, to be honest with you, Michael, as I look back in my older self and I look back, you know, five, six, seven years ago, I would say that some of that was largely my judgment, trusting in people that I shouldn't have or investing in people that I shouldn't have. And I'm here to tell you once and for all, I have zero regrets. Zero. I don't blame them. I don't blame me. I don't blame anybody. I would do it all again. Maybe I would do my older self would do things a little differently. But I'm super proud of everything that I've done. I stand behind everything that I've done. And I think it made me a much better person and a much better leader than I was when I started. And th thank you for saying that, especially at the end, because I believe that sometimes amongst business leaders, there's not always the appetite for downside. And if something doesn't work out, if there's a mistake that's made, if a team member doesn't work out, I see people give up and say, you know what, people are this kind of way. Maybe I won't try again. And what what's kept you going? What's kept you you persisting? I'm shooting new episodes right now as we speak. Uh, first time since the beginning of COVID, and I was uh, I was uh, reluctant to do any more. I was reluctant after getting sued by business owners by having you know uh, law firms try to gather up people to come after me. I was reluctant to do it. Uh, and then I started doing it again and I realized what I loved and what I loved was meeting somebody new and hearing their story and feeling like I can help them. And maybe I'm navigating a little differently today than I used to. And maybe I'm, you know, a little tighter with my own process than I used to be. But the spirit of, of, of taking chances on people with currency and with time, uh, it seems to be in my blood. And I'll admit this to you. My wife says this to me. She says, you know, you say you like business. The reality of it is, is that you're a deal junkie. You like to do deals because you like what it, the adrenaline rush that comes from it. And you could be investing in some hot sauce that you don't even like, and you get caught up in it. Uh, she says, that's part of what I love about you. And part of what makes me crazy is that you have this blind trust of people. And you know that a percentage of them are going to screw you. And my response to her is, yeah, but they have to look at that. Not me. And with the lessons you've learned over the years, what's, what's your number one non-negotiable as CEO? The mistreatment of coworkers and the mistreatment of, of other people. You know, you can have an opinion about the way you run your business. And I, I, if I showed you my phone now, you'd see hundreds of texts that I let any of the 12,000 people text me about anything other than their pay. But the one non-negotiable that exists in any business that I'm involved in is we can disagree, we can argue like brothers and sisters, but we can never disrespect each other. And if you do, you, you don't work here anymore. And it doesn't really matter. And I know that sounds a little superficial, but you know we spend more time at work than we do with our families. And the last thing I want to do is hang out with somebody that I don't like or that doesn't like me. And, and I know that over the past year, you've been particularly vocal about the impact of the pandemic on business, uh, going as far as even publicly calling out numerous political leaders, both the federal and even state level, um, which is the CEO of a publicly traded company, I'm sure is, you know, carries you know, with it some, some liability perhaps. But what I've always seen is that you offered to meet with these people, collaborate with them, to, to, you know, even donate your own money to support. You know, what was always baffling to me was that why weren't they all taking you up on it? Because it, it sounded to an extent like that was falling on deaf ears. The best advice I can give a CEO is the best advice that I don't take, which is to stay out of the public forum of, 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 uh, of hot topics in society. The challenge that I have is that I live two separate lives. I live the life of a public company CEO and owner, and I have a responsibility to serve at the pleasure of the shareholders and my employees and my customers. And I have a responsibility Maybe it's uh, self-anointed or self-inflicted. I haven't figured out which one it is to be the uh, voice for people who don't have a voice. And I, I struggle with where those lines become very blurry. And in many cases, it's gotten me in trouble financially, uh, publicly. 
Uh, and, and, and most people that are very close to me will tell me, please, please stop. And my response is, I can't because I can't figure out who's going to solve the problem for the people that either A, don't have the resources to solve their own problem or B, don't have the voice box. And I don't want to be the seller. And so if standing up for what is right is going to cost me money personally, then so be it. I have, to, I will tell you something that I've never told anybody because I, I had this several times that I always am conflicted of when the right time is for me to amplify one voice box and turn off the other. Because it's hard to live two separate lives. And uh, I will say to you candidly that I will never shut off my voice box of uh, helping out smaller businesses. And so whatever people want to deduce from that, they can do it on their own. But if you made me choose today, like if somebody said to me, you, you cannot do both anymore. You must choose between advocating for businesses across America and giving your money away to small restaurants when they can't pay their bills and giving grants to women owned businesses and minority owned businesses or, uh, uh, being the CEO of a public company. You cannot do both. I can tell you that it would be a very easy decision for me. And it would be one that I think, um, uh, would give me the most important legacy of all. And that's not built on wealth, that's built on impact. And that to me, um, that to me is ultimately what I want to be known for is providing impact in a voice box, not getting to 10 billion or making a billion or two billion. Like, I get it. I get it. I, I get it. It's like, do I like the fact that the company makes money? Sure. But I like what I can do with the money more than I like anything else. Did I just admit to you that I'd rather do that than run a public company? I think I did. <laughs> well, the way you presented it, who, you know, I, I don't know that that would catch you liability, but who could, who could go against, you know, um, helping people in need? So you can tell you're obviously a generous person. And, and I've, I've always, it's funny, I, I share this with my wife every time I see it. Like somebody will, will, will send you a tweet and they'll say something along the lines of like, they're struggling. They could, you, uh, just as an example, they could use a better computer or something like that. And you'll respond back and say, all right, I'll buy you a new computer and I'll work to send business your way. And this happens all the time. And I'm just curious, like, are you, what's happening in that moment? Are you just like on your way to a meeting or like sitting in bed and you're saying like, this person needs help. I can provide them with help. Let me just tweet them back. I'll give you the game plan. If you needed something from me, I'll give you the playbook, okay? Don't send that kind of tweet out between eight in the morning and five or six during the week because I'm engrossed in my camping world business. If you're trying to get my attention, try to figure out what coast I'm on and find me after dinner time. And the likelihood of something good happening uh, is, is pretty good. And usually on the weekends uh, is probably where I'm the most vulnerable. Uh, my friends will tell me, my man, you got to stop trying to help everybody. And my response is, you should try helping somebody. Because when you get it in your system, and there are people that take advantage, okay? But when you get it into your system and you see the impact that it can have on other people, and then you see that the people that follow you also rally behind it to also give that person business, I do it largely because I'm hoping and praying that God forbid if I ever needed to send out a tweet like that, that somebody would respond to mine. And I'm, I have no guarantees in life that that would happen. But I'm hoping and praying that if I do it enough and people remember that, that if God forbid I ever needed a meal or needed a place to stay or needed something because I made a wrong decision that cost me everything, that somebody that I helped out that needed a computer that maybe got a job that maybe made a little money would be able to feed me. It's a weird way to look at it, but it's in my sick head, that's my rationalization. Like you said, I think we could all do, do something to help people with more. And, and in a way I almost view it as a tragedy that if you can make a certain impact or if you can help someone and you don't, 
you know, that you're almost doing a disservice to the world. So yeah, but where, uh, do, but where does it start and stop? And that's the challenge, you know, and that's for me, that's been, that's been, been the hardest part is that I'm having a very difficult time as a business leader, whether it's with my associates or with customers or with people on social or small businesses is I, I, I do have to find the balance of, of it eating me alive and, and not feeling like I'm not doing enough. And I, I definitely struggle with that. I, I would say that that's my Achilles heel right now. And, and roughly how many, how many companies at, at this point do you own or are a part of? Well, let's start with uh, what is being a part of me because I'm on the phone with people who have no financial interest in their business, but I met them somewhere and they want to talk to me for a half hour. Or I have other friends who are like, look, can you talk to my sister? My sister wants to start something. And so I have a financial interest in over 50 businesses. When I say a financial interest, where I actually feel like I'm going to get either paid back or I'm going to make a profit. I don't include the ones where I gave them a grant or I made an investment and I know I'm never going to see it again or I have no interaction with them again. I take that off the table. But but about 50, not including the people that I talk to that I don't have a stake in or my primary uh, camping oil business. So, so I'm sure you've never been asked this question before, but how do you balance, I don't know if balance is the right word, between being CEO of Camping World and all these other, you know, ventures and, and the and the businesses that also pull at your time. I think it's very simple. I look at the Camping World business as my as my true family. I don't have any children, so my Camping World business is like asking me, "Do you spend time with your family? Are they a priority? Do you make sure your family has a roof over their head and they have food on the table? And do you make sure they're educated and that you're providing opportunity and education?" That's how I think about my camping world business. So it it supersedes everything in my life. And sometimes my wife would argue that it supersedes her. Um, I work hard to make sure that it doesn't, but it gets the lion's share of my time. And then the small businesses get pretty much the rest of my time. What that leaves me is not much. And uh, I can complain about it to you, but I will not because that's a life that I chose. That's something that I decided to dedicate my life to. No different than a high school football coach who doesn't see his family much because he's dedicated to his players. Same kind of concept. Like, don't complain about something that you signed up for. You chose it. It's the life that I chose. And I look at it as a gift from God, the chance that I have to work with all these people. I really do look at it as a gift. Sometimes I'm mad and sometimes it feels like a curse, but mostly it feels like a gift. So, Marcus, I know you mentioned your wife. I, I've read that you know you and your wife have worked collaboratively in, in some of your business ventures, and that she's even helped to manage uh, some of these businesses. So, for those listening that work with their spouse, uh, for example, I work with my spouse, or even ones that are considering it, how have you made this partnership work on, on the business level? The businesses that that your spouse is involved in, they should own, and they should be able to make the ultimate decision because the last thing you want to have happen is to create conflict. I enjoy working with my wife, but I also know where my role starts and where it stops. And uh, I do my best to live by that. I'm not totally successful, but I do my best to live at it. And there are a lot of times where I bring her into the equation, even when it's not a business, where I just want her to be informed. She is a on her own right and her own right she is one of the largest shareholders of Camping World in her own right, not from, not from my money. She had accumulated wealth over the years. And when COVID hit, and she knew our business better than most people because she understands you know, like, that this isn't like a one and done thing. When the open periods allowed her to, she went out and bought a bunch of stock. And uh, she took a good chunk of her life savings and did it. And I remember saying to her, first of all, you have to comply with everything I comply with because you know what's happening. So you have your quiet periods and all those things. And you shouldn't put all your eggs in one basket. And she looked at me and she said, our business is worth way more than this. I'm going to buy all the stock that I can. And today, when we get up in the morning, if the stock's up or down, I try not to look at it. She'll be like, look at how much I have. 
look at how much I have. And I said, yeah, easy come, easy go. And she said, no, 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 no. I want to know, like, what other stores are you buying? What are we doing? What are the margins? What's happening? You're spending, you're not spending enough time over here. You need to spend up enough time over here. And all of the employees uh, who know my wife well love the fact that she's so vested in it because she additionally keeps me focused. And I think she enjoys it. It gives us something to, to do together. But she's a grinder. She'll ask me when the dividend's coming and what the distribution's going to be and if there's going to be a special one. And I obviously, in a lot of cases, I have to tell her, I can't, babe, I can't answer you. Like, I, I can't tell you everything. So you can imagine how that goes. And this is this has come up on a, on a few podcasts where you know a lot of business leaders talking about the fact that there's perhaps no greater ROI than investing in your own business or investing in yourself, um, at least from the aspect of things that you can control. Um, what what are your thoughts on that? Like in terms of where people should invest their dollars if they are business owners. Well, I'm going to answer that question if they're business owners. If you're business owners like myself, I don't own stock in any public company other than my own. And, you know, I don't take a salary out of the company. I haven't in five years. I don't take $1 out of Camping World. I get no stock options, no grants, no, they don't pay for any of my expenses because I really want you as a shareholder to be on the same elevator as me. And I continue to buy, when I get any extra cash, I continue to buy shares. Some people think it's irresponsible that I'm putting all of my eggs in one basket. And my response to them is, no, I'm putting all of my eggs in my own pocket, in my own basket. And if I don't believe enough in what I'm doing to put my money down on the table, how could I, in God's name, ask somebody else to do it? The challenge that it has for me is at some point I have to take something off the table because I have to live. And that uh, that is a fine balance between having people understand that or not. But I I want people to invest in themselves. But if they have a couple extra nickels and they want to feel what it feels like to see other people succeed, take a portion of what you're doing and invest in other people. Be smart about it, but do it. Now, things have changed a lot in the past year. Um, I wanted to ask you, if you were the CEO of a law firm today, what would be your top priority? We're operating in a different world today. And those who understand the digital platforms and the ability to transact with customers online through text, through leads, through database management, will ultimately be the ones that are here tomorrow. Granted, you still have to be a good lawyer. Granted, you still have to operate with the highest level of ethics. Granted, you still have to be able to market yourself. But when you get that lead, what are you doing with it? And I know of a lot of law firms that don't have systems in place today for lead funnel management, for database management, for retention management, for reputation management. And if they want to operate in 2025, they better get on those things. That's my opinion. And Marcus, shifting gears from that, with, with all the things you're involved with, what are some of the, the daily habits you practice like, that, that help to keep you on track and that's operating in a, you know, in, a, in a peak state? Recruiting, 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 recruiting. I, I wake up every day and I wonder, where am I going to find the next great talent? And I know that, that I'm, I'm, I'm struggling as a leader because of my deficiencies in certain areas. I'm not a technology guy. I'm not the best marketing guy. I don't know how to manufacture something. I don't know how to, uh, you know, repair a car. I don't know how to uh, do a lot of different things. And so the only thing that I do know how to do is identify good talent and put them in positions where they can run businesses better than me and receive compensation that's better than they had before. But I, I spend the bulk of my time recruiting. Second thing that I do is I'm a list maker. If I showed you all my papers, you know, that are in front of me, I'm a doodler, but I'm really a list maker. And when I go to bed the night before, I write down the four or five things that I have to get done tomorrow and the four or five things that I'd like to get done tomorrow. And I work hard to the best of my ability to try to knock those things out, not because I need to feel accomplished, but because other people are relying on me. And I learned that the bigger that my holdings got and the more that I required people to have to get approval from me, the more I became a cog in their wheel. And so that's why recruiting became so important because I just, 
I can't, people can't be waiting for me to get to them. You, you hinted at this earlier, but it seems like you get a lot of advice. I'm just curious, what's been the best advice you've received and, and, and perhaps the worst advice you've received? The worst advice that I've received is don't change and always be yourself. The best advice I've received is be who you are, but understand that the world changes and the people around you change. And in both cases, they gave me permission to be myself. But in one case, they acknowledged the need to be a chameleon. And so I, I don't want anybody to tell me not to wear purple gym shoes or not to, to fight for people. But I think it's okay if people wiser and smarter than me say, you know what? I know that your intent is pure. And I know that your, 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 your goals are pure. But I think if you went about it this way, it may be better for you and it may be better for others. So try it this way. And I love feedback. I love constructive feedback. And I usually, oddly enough, I seek feedback from the oddest of places. I seek it from not the wealthy people or the successful people uh, as, as America defines it. I seek feedback from the most unassuming people and places because they're closer to reality than I am. And, and Marcus, as we come to a close, this being the Game Changing Attorney Podcast, what does being a game changer mean to you? It means taking a chance on yourself and taking a chance on other people and trusting in people and that the good old fashioned handshake is the single biggest game changer in business today. That if you shake somebody's hand, it should mean something. And that if you, if you honor that, they'll learn the same and they'll do the same. And that's the game changing moment.